Kennedy, I want to start with you. We were talking backstage about Nairobi, about Kenya, about all the challenges. You have said before that really poor people stuck in slums worry most about survival. How did you connect that to the whole gender discrimination issue? How did you get involved in this? And how did you get people who live around you to support what you're doing? Thank you so much, President. I think when I, when I was living in Kipera slums, what I saw around is that my mom, and she had like eight kids. She was the only person who could go out to look for food, you know? And other women around my surrounding were really working hard. And we passed, it's, it, honestly, it's a place whereby you, you go days without food, you know? And that's part of the life. And I was, not, I was not happy with that kind of life. In a country whereby if you are poor, your kids will be poor, your generation will be poor. But we also needed a better life. And I knew through this is by passion and a dream. You know? So I, I, was, I, was, I was dreaming, for, I was dreaming for, for a better life. At the age of eight, I was a street boy or a homeless kid. You know? I had to sell the peanuts to pay my school fees. I went to informal school, honestly, you know? But sometimes young people or your community need motivation, you know? And then I looked at the heroes, like President Bill Clinton. Honestly, I read your story when I was in the Kibera to see that you talk about your presidency, but you have a story before being president. I remember when you say that you sat on a governor's chair, you know? That was a dream, you know? And I have the same dream. I read the books of Martin Luther King, you know? I read the book of Nelson Mandela, and I say, if they can do it, we can also do it here, you know. And I formed a movement with, with a soccer ball. We came together, we played. The dream came true. People started trusting us in the community, you know. From there, I became, they called me mayor of Kibera, informal mayor, you know. And I was able to get a scholarship to, to the U.S. But... It's one other thing. It is amazing, and I'm touched that you remember this. What I told it, he's referring to a, a, something I wrote in my book. I was the first person in my family ever to go to college. When I was 10 years old, I visited the state capitol. I was in the fifth grade, and the governor had a policy that whenever he was not in the office, if a school group came, that they should immediately take all the children in and let them all sit in the governor's chair. <laughs> I love that. And... You know, when I was 10, it was just a hoot. But the minute I sat in the chair, I could imagine myself being governor, <laughs> which was ridiculous. But so when I became governor, I let all the kids sit in my chair. And when I became president, whenever people came to the Oval Office and wanted a picture, if there was a child in the group, I made the child sit in the president's chair. Because I think that, you know, somehow... You imagine this, but the problem that someone like you has, and this is, I want you to just address this, and I got a question I want to ask John, but how did you get other people to help you help others? Because we can all relate to one star. You know, there's some people like you that if nothing ever changed there, look at you, look at who you are. You know, unless you just throw them against the wall and break their brains, they're going to do okay. They're just something heroic and, and, uh, and determined and gritty and, you know, shining about it, which is why people want to follow you. How did you get people to understand that you weren't what we call a one-off? <laughs> that is, that it wasn't just you, that, that all these kids deserved a better future. How, how, how have you done that? How have you gotten people to think beyond you and, and just what you do to your efforts to help all the other kids that live there? I think they, everybody in life, they know what is happening in their life and they know, everyone knows that there's injustice in the world. But what they need, sometimes people need what's called eye opener. And we have a few individuals like you guys who are here what you are doing, you want people to do, we want people to see the way you are seeing the problem in their own eyes, you know? So when I was just like, oh, Kennedy, this is not the life I want to live. This is not a good life. But I believe that if we come together, we can fight this. 
we can fight this giant of poverty. We can fight this, you know. So I, I invited young people to my, to my room, in my house, and I told them, I wanted to make them see the problem the way I'm seeing it, you know. And I had to explain, and then people need hope. They were hopeless, you see. And they were like, you have to, when you have hope, and when I use the character like your name, Mandela, you know, they feel motivated because a problem for us has been when you are looking, everyone was like, Kennedy, we can't do it. Tell me anybody who has come from poverty, who has made it in life. And honestly, we only see politicians. And this is politician and this from upper class family. <laughs> so when a politician tells you like, you are the leader of tomorrow, and you know where the politician is coming from, you know? Will you trust that politician? So they needed some faith and hope, you know? And I felt that I was able to portray that hope using other figures, heroes, you know, that they can relate to. You get? So the, the idea is that have hope and try to find a way how they can see the world the way you are seeing it. You know, and I was able to have some few young people who are also who felt motivated. Then they're going to do the work. If everybody in this crowd sent you $10, what would you do with it? Every person out here sent you $10 for your brain. What would you do with the money? Okay, if they want, <laughs> that's a good question, President. <laughs> I don't get a percentage. Uh, yeah. it. What I'll do with the ten dollar is like I will. Uh, I know in the community what they, they, they. I have a school for girls in in Kibera, you know, and I will buy more books for the for the girls, you know. That I'll do with the money because right now we we need more books. And why did you make a decision to set up a school for girls? How did you come to that decision? I read that an enormous percentage of girls in Kibera are already selling sex for food by the time they're 16 years old. How did you, how did you do that? And was there, was there any resistance to providing more education for girls when you started doing it? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, well, uh, the school for girls came through my experience, you know. I saw my mom, what she was passing through, and my sisters at the age of 16, they all became pregnant. They left school, you know, they, and their life was hard. And then, so these kind of challenges, and if I felt like women are the engine of development in any society. And, uh, President, I also wanted to add what is called a value on, a woman, on the women, you know? So starting a school for girls, at the same time starting other social services like the health center that we have, Sometimes men in, the, in, in Kibera, they are so proud, you know, but when they come in the school for girls and start reading newspaper, when they come to the Kibera school and start using the toilet, the little toilet, when they come to the school, when they are sick to the hostel, they say, I'm going to Kibera school for girls. And then it's adding value on them. Like, without this Kibera school for girls, no health center. So instead of, I realize that this is a, it's not a fight of one, of, of one gender. You have to fight it all. And honestly, now, Kibera men are supporting me in this work. Sean, when you first got a big airplane and you filled it full of supplies for the people of Haiti, when you went down there the first time, did you have any idea you were going to stay? No, no. I, the, the intention at that point was to go down for approximately two weeks. That's what the, we had our, our own self-sustaining supplies for. Um, but then once we got down there, there was a... You know, I, I had seen in, during Katrina that there was a certain level, and, and, and notwithstanding any missteps or incompetence in, in the government reaction to Katrina, one can see in these kinds of circumstances that there is going to be another chaos. There's going to be, there, there, there are new challenges that, are, that have to be quickly learned and adapted to in the best of circumstances. So in, in a sense, there was that, that, that confidence that one wasn't going to be in the way, that there were going to be gaps to fill. Um, there is, the, with, in, in, in the situation of Haiti, where there was so little infrastructure to begin with, and that, and, and that one who's, who spends any time or has any investment in Haiti wants to always remind people that, that this, was, this was an earthquake, but that, 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 it was a, that it's a poverty issue. It was a poverty earthquake. When I was a kid, 
a, a young teenager, there was a 7.0 earthquake in Los Angeles where I think 20 people died. And here, as many as two, 200, 250,000 people died in the, in the same level earthquake. So this had to do with the training, the, the lack of proper building codes, materials, all of this stuff in terms of the, the, the buildings collapsing, uh, 20 of 21 government buildings collapsing. So it wasn't hard to, to, to quickly see the ways in which you could continue to add value. Um, some of that uh, based on uh, mistakes or, or things that were not being focused on, that it seemed very, that there was a common sense approach that wasn't being uh, universally um, embraced. Uh, and that we, f and, and, and in some way, I think we benefited from our naivete. All right, here we are. We were all sitting around you and I, or at least on pins and needles, waiting for the Electoral Commission to certify the person who won the election and who will be the next president of Haiti. What do you think is the most important thing that those of us who are trying to help Haiti can do to take the next steps and to maximize their ability to chart a totally different and better future for themselves? Well, I, I think to the, that the, one of the biggest complications you know, I've, I, I would argue that, but for immediate life-saving, that the NGOs have, by and large, been an inhibitor to progress in, in Haiti. In, um, Explain that to them. Tell them why you think Well, that. It's, it, it, it goes to a lot of things, and I, and I get perceived as somehow, you know, trying to step out as, as somehow separate from this, but I'm very much part of this thing that has to evolve and, 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 and the reason I'm, I'm part of it as, as, as those I might criticize are part of it is because the effort has for so long been to compete with each other for funds rather than to compete together against poverty. And it's the simplification that's kind of a cancer in these situations is the, the, two, the alternating cultures of disaster relief and sustainable development, which have to, in Haiti, we have, for example, I think somewhere around 65% of the buildings that were stamped red, meaning those buildings that are not inhabitable post-earthquake, some 65% have been re-inhabited. All of the work of the NGOs that's, that's, that's happened with one earthquake could go right back to, to January 12th. There's about 650,000 people still in the camps that are in, living in incredibly unsanitary, vulnerable conditions with new weather systems on the, on the way again. So <clears throat> in, this, in, in, the, in the moving forward of it, I think that the, the whole idea of, first of all, I think people have to start being very honest with donors and, as, and, and educating donors on what, what their money does. And so that there's, and in, in Haiti now, why I think that there's a great opportunity, and I would say that I'm cautiously optimistic about what can happen, especially as there's, there's likely going to be a president who, at, at the very least, can take the world stage, I think can, can create a, a sense of, of, of a dy dynamism that matches that of, of, of one's response to Haiti when, when one goes there so that he can speak to those who have not been, been there and, and encourage some belief in, in a treadmill that has gone on in travesty for so long. But Haiti is, the, the response, that the, the feeling that one has going there is that this is the place where you can show a great example of the most hopeless circumstances being turned around. And one where, with the proper coordination, with an integration of, of those cultures of emergency relief, sustainable development, certainly the Haitians are, uh, and, and they're so you know, often miss uh, uh, the, the perception of a dependence that's been created. That's about a 12-hour psychosocial course because these are people that would be able to rebuild the pyramids. This is one of the, the, the most resilient culture that, that not only myself, as someone who's traveled somewhat, but all of the people who are far more experienced than I have, 
than I am in this that, that I've worked with in Haiti say the same thing. There's something, there's something about Haiti. And the, and the something about Haiti that's most important is that if we complete the... Uh, backtrack one second. What happens in this competitive culture of NGOs is that there are projects that, that lend themselves to emotional support of donors and they become kind of trendy. And so the NGOs tend to do demonstrations of project completion, which are ultimately left incomplete, considered in the long term a failure, which they would be, uh, in an effort to move on to whatever is, 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 is the most financeable next step. And that, that, that comes out of, <clears throat> that comes really out of the, the, the way in which those two cultures of, of emergency relief and sustainable development have not found a way to, to recognize uh, their, their parallel course. Yeah, let me explain that the, the place in the world where these problems were reconciled best, in my opinion, and it's somewhat self-serving for me to say it, I'll explain why, was in uh, Aceh in Indonesia after the tsunami. Because when the, the UN asked me to work there for a couple of years and coordinate it, I, I said, look, our goal should be to work our way out of a job. I mean, why does he have a school for girls? Because if he educates them properly, they don't need to be dependent on him for the rest of their lives, and they can have their own families. They can help their own communities. So if you do any kind of NGO work that's not a disaster, you should be dedicated to making yourselves irrelevant to the day-to-day -day sustainability of the people you're supporting. There is no other <laughs> rational way. So, for the first time ever when, uh, in a large-scale disaster in, the, in Indonesia, we developed a, a, basically an online tracking system where we put the government donations of the donor countries the World Bank and all those other people. Everybody was giving money with the private NGO spending. We got all the major NGOs to agree to sign up. And everything had to be approved according to the economic plan that the Indonesians had developed. And then we did it together so that it wasn't like they were establishing a beachhead among these poor people and then they could keep helping them forever. And I have to say that it was easier in Indonesia because the president of Indonesia put a magnificent man named Pakantoro in charge of it, and it was easier because it was one small province of a very vast country. This was the capital of Haiti. It was 30% uh, of the population, two-thirds of the GDP crushed in a day. It's harder, but it's the same thing. And so this is the first time we've ever gotten, like a lot of the NGOs who agree, to put up on our, you can go down and check our website now and you can see at least how the NGOs are spending their money, that every expenditure of any amount uh, by most of the NGOs is approved by the commission. The Haiti Commission is now half Haitian and half donors. They all work it together. Whether we'll succeed or not, I have no earthly idea. But what he's telling you is true. And the Haitians have been abused and neglected but they've also been patronized. As this, oh, this is so much poorer than any other part of our hemisphere. It's like we'll be able to pour our hearts out there for life. That's not what they need. They need for you to give them the support to stand on their own two feet, make their own decisions, whether you like it or not, raise their kids, and build a future. That is what we are, and at least that's what he and I are trying to do. And I, you know, when the next, when the next president is, Inaugurated in Haiti, if that president decides that, whoa, if that president decides he or she wants me to go, I would happily leave. I think it is more important to have the country in control of its own destiny. I just want them to do the right things. And, but to give you an example, I, I said this last night, a lot of you heard this, that Haitians in the United States are less than 2% of our African-American population, but they're 11% of our African-American doctors. When uh, Henri Christophe won an inter-Haitian struggle to lead Haiti, the Haitians with not a single university graduate, much less anybody trained in architecture, built 27 mountain fortresses 
in the hills above Port-au-Prince and the rest of the country. And they did organized drills in all the communities. They said, we think the French will come again for us, or the British will come, or the Spanish will come. We want you to be able to climb into the mountains, be in a fortress, and be safe. Or if they're all filled, you can go into the woods, into the forest, that all of which were protected by this circle of fortresses. The largest of those fortresses, built in 1820, La Citadel, still exists almost as it was built. And you look at it, it's inconceivable that people with no education, no architectural training, nothing, built what is to this day still the most impressive architectural achievement in the entire Caribbean. People don't need to be patronized, they need to be empowered. And I think that's very important for all of you when you do your projects to realize that there may come, there should come a day when whoever it is you're helping doesn't need you anymore. And that should be all of our goals, in my opinion. So, what, are the, what do you think the next two or three things are that we ought to really focus on? It, let's assume that the government of Haiti is settled and the public believes it's an honest election and a new president's coming in. What do you believe the first thing, two or three things I ought to do are? What are the first two or three things you, you ought to do? Well, I, I think that beginning with what the new president and the likely new president will, will do is to establish with support the kind of sense of security that will allow investment, that businesses can come. You know, when we're separate and apart from reconstruction, just based on areas where one is decompressing camps, doing rubble removal in neighborhoods, and trying to get people back either in, within Port-au-Prince or in following the mandate of decentralization, that ultimately where you, where you encourage people to go to make it better than being in camps needs jobs. So there's been, with, with Haiti being a country that I think it's, uh, since 1804, 45 heads of state and five have left office alive. Um, so it has this legendary history of, of, of instability. It's very overrated. Um, this, it, it's a country where uh, there are American companies that are doing well there, uh, Vala being one of them. There's Digicel is there. They're, 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 they're the, those who take bold steps, whether it's in the NGO world or the business world in Haiti, have actually come to find that, that even under the, these very complicated circumstances, there's a place for business and investment in Haiti. One of the, I think, to unapologetically encourage that investment, to understand that what is a sweatshop in an American perspective is for a few dollars more, perhaps, an opportunity for a job, and that Haitians, given the right to organize labor, will get their due. They will, they will take care of that. In the meantime, get the manufacturing, get the jobs. Look, for, I, I agree with that. That's basically what I was doing before the earthquake and all this stuff. But let me just tell you to try to emphasize what he said. In most countries, poor people are not kept poor by their own poverty or their poor neighbors. They're kept poor by the rich people in the country who do selfish and short-sighted things or by, or by a system they can't figure out how to get out of. Let me just give you an example. The Caribbean has the highest electric rates in the world because only Trinidad has any oil or gas. They have to bring everything in. Now, it's a miracle. We've, you know, we, we give duty-free access to our markets to a lot of Haitian products, so we've been able to get some manufacturing. The people that work down there adore it, but the, they love the people, but they have their own generators. They have to generate their own electricity. They're worried about the cost. So one of the things I'm trying to do is to break the monopoly of going through one power source having all this oil uh, or diesel imported at very high prices then get a markup on it. We need a decentralized competitive system. If you heard the comments <coughs> of the president, Charlie Jackson, the president of Rensselaer last night, who's an energy expert, we need to decentralize this and maximize solar and wind and other alternatives in Haiti and throughout the Caribbean to do that. If you use the port, there should be three ports 
Uh, Jamaica has a per capita income much higher than Haiti. The Haitian port fees are higher than they are in Jamaica. The jet fuel costs more. Now, part of that, in fairness to the government and the business interest is, because they have always been so poor, they've never had a broad-based effective tax system, so we're trying to help them set it up. So you follow choke point revenues, where you just, Willie Sutton said he robbed banks because that's where the money was. So you go to the ports, you go to the airports, that's where the money is. People have to get in, they have to do business, so you charge more. They have to have electricity, you charge more. It is a crazy thing to do. And so I agree with you, and that's what we're trying to do. Now, that, now it brings me back to you. Kennedy, you, you've worked hard to empower women, and presumably you could have 10 schools in Kibera that you could fill with girls that need this. But let's just uh, let's assume for the moment that, that because what you're doing is so compelling and that you get more support on that, have you given any thought to whether you could put economically viable operations in the slum that would change the economic circumstances of people there, that they could start their own businesses or otherwise make, uh, do things that would give their kids a better future? Yes, that's a good point, President. And even now you can see this bracelet is being made by women with HIV AIDS who are trying to make their life. We also have, we have initiated water, water tanks that are bringing income. And we have a community center, Shofko Community Center, whereby women and men come to meet and share their ideas of entrepreneurship, you know, and how they can start their own business, you know. So we have been holding, we also have savings, you know. So I believe that economy of a place is very, very important because, President, honestly, Kibera is a country of its own, you know. People who live there, they, you'll, you'll see people on the road trying to sell things. You know? People are really working hard. Young men, my friends, are having barber shop. You know? That's what they're doing. You know? So also, we're also trying to help them by, you know, by, in, by giving them some small loans. You know? Yeah, so that's very, very important. So part. you're providing microcredit loans? Yes. What's the average size of a loan? Well, right now, it, that, it's more like 4,000. That's like, mm, divided by 80. Mm, Fifty? Fifty dollars? Yeah. How do people cook there in Kibera? Do they use charcoal? So many people use charcoal. People use the paraffin. And it's always difficult to get because it's really high priced. There's a project in a neighborhood in Port-au-Prince that was going on in the aftermath of the hurricanes of 2008, before this earthquake, that I have tried to support that you should think about. I would be glad to get these people the help if you're interested in. But I thought about it a lot in uh, Kenya. You, a lot of you know who uh, Wangari Maathai is, who won the Nobel Prize for trying to plant 30 million trees in Kenya and all that. But in the last uh, couple of years, almost all the new plantings have been taken down amidst the poverty and difficulty, and you're back, Kenya is about to get back to a 1 or 2% forest cover, which is devastating for agriculture and devastation for water quality. But anyway, it, what they do, and this has been really a, a amazing thing, in this rather large neighborhood in Port-au-Prince where more than 100,000 people were living before the earthquake, uh, this community group organized first a group of women to go and pick up all the garbage because they had no garbage collection except for big centralized containers for near businesses. Then they would uh, do the recycling separation. They'd separate all the glass, the plastic, the metal, and sell that. Then they designed their own way of shredding all the paper products and making the wet and putting them in a mold and then drying them out and cutting them up into little briquettes, which they sold for cooking. Three of these briquettes sold for about 40%, uh, 30% of what charcoal would cost and did the same thing. Over, over the course of a week, a, a family could cut by 70% the cost of preparing dinner. And for poor people, it's a big deal. So when this is over, if you're interested, 
Maybe I could get you some of the people to you know, tell you how to do it. But it's the great thing about it is it, we employed so many more people. And if you cut the people in who are bringing in the charcoal, so you understand they've got a legitimate need to make a living, then you at least give the people a chance who are trying to keep the trees up. But uh, I hope that once we resolve these housing issues and, and we can see Port-au-Prince in neighborhood form again, that we will be able to do this all over the city because one of my goals before I die is to close every landfill in every big city in the world because they are c contributing to global warming with methane gas and they're gold mines. You know, I see that the way some people see oil wells. I look at these landfills and they're full of things that can be recycled. And if you turn them into generating electricity, then you give the land back to poor people. You can give, you could have playgrounds for your schools. You could have, you know, you could do all this. So if you have any interest in it, I'll try to help. Let's see if we got some questions here. Uh, text questions. God, oh, wait a minute. I didn't bring the right glasses. Okay, for Sean. Now that the spotlight is faded and the initial funding rush is gone, how can we ensure that Haiti remains a priority in the international community? Well, this is, this is always a struggle. Um, there, there, there are a lot of ways in which the spotlight needs to show. I thought, I thought when President Clinton mentioned um, uh, those within the, within the country that uh, hold a kind of stranglehold on, on their own, that um, there, there's, a, there's a great call for media to do, uh, it would be very simple, it's only about 10 families, I think a, a, a great uh, expose on them would be an exciting thing for Americans and Haitians to see, and, and, um, and, and, and by expose I don't mean to, to presume something critical, but just to, to let people know what they do, how they do it, uh, and what level of investment they, they, or responsibility they feel to their own country and their own people uh, as demonstrated by uh, the ways in which they've worked in the country. Uh, some have been uh, productive. Uh, largely, it's been a third, third government, second to the government of Haiti and the NGO culture itself, um, in, in if, to defining government by those who have power and, and money at hand. Uh, and, and, and one of the great creators of this kind of continuing system of, of a country that should be exporting and is, and is, is largely importing. Um, the, 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 when I talk about it, because, you know, it's very difficult. I was in Berlin recently at a Cinema for Peace event, and they, the documentaries that they were celebrating called attention to so many parts of the world in so much need, whether it be the disaster, and then we have things, Libya and Japan and all of these, these things that certainly take emotional precedence and in, in many cases legitimate precedence for, for periods of time in, in response. But over and over again, the, the United States, our, our country, as an American, I, I, I see this incredible opportunity to really show a win a win that's great for Haiti, that's great for the United States of America. Uh, this administration uniquely, I believe, is poised not to exploit Haiti, but to help Haiti if Haiti is willing, and they are, to help themselves. Uh, you've got a, a gem of a place in terms of human resources to, to take a, a carbon footprint that might once have, have uh, burned everything uh, in, in its path all the way from China to just an hour and a half from the United States. Uh, it's a very fixable place and it's the kind of success that is worth the investment, that is worth the attention of the media and the, and, and the media has to be reminded of this and, and, I, and one of the things I think for example um, that some bold moves in terms of, and particularly outside of Port-au-Prince, in terms of the immediate establishment of, of, of manufacturing, of schools, of hospitals, outside giving, giving uh, incentive for people to disperse that incredibly dense pop population in Port-au-Prince. Uh, yeah, that's something you should all know that. We, we've, you've all read about the deforestation in Haiti, but one real problem is 
three million people lived in the Port-au-Prince area and that beautiful bowl of land where it's built, looking out to the water, was built for about 200,000. But uh, one of the things that I want to put in a little plug here, one of the things that makes me hopeful about Haiti is that this is the first time that its neighbors have looked at, at Haiti as a partner and a potential growth center, not a basket case next door. The Brazilians have been great. The Argentines have been great. The Caribbean community has been great. Uh, Luis Alberto Moreno, the head of the Inter-American Development Bank, they've been great. And uh, President Obama asked uh, Hillary to take over the, you know, lead the Americans' response because he knew that we'd been down there in 75 and we cared about it. And her chief of staff, Cheryl Mills, has virtually lived there. And we are, they just, they did the work to get Brazil's first ever textile mill and the biggest clothing manufacturing investment they ever got. They'll get a minimum of 20,000, maybe 40,000 jobs out of it. Uh, the Royal Caribbean Line and Bob Johnson, who founded Black Entertainment Television, they promised to build not one but two resorts in the north of Haiti once we get the airport there expanded and a road built. And one of the problems that we've had, is, Sean was talking about the elite families that have monopolies or virtual control. What I've, I've gone to them and said, look, I don't want to put anybody out of business. You'll make more money if you do business with me. You just won't control things. And what you have to decide is, would you rather have 10% of a billion dollars or 100% of $1,000? You do the math. In other words, you shouldn't try to maintain your political, I mean, your economic standing by holding everybody else in your country back. And 19% of Haiti's income every year comes from people like you that go out of the country and they send money back to support their families, remittances. Just charging fees and converting it into Haitian gourds, banks can make a healthy amount of money. So there's no small business lending. If you're a small business person in Haiti, if, if Sean and I weren't famous, if we were just, you know, a Haitian diaspora and we wanted to go home, we'd have to pay 45% interest at a time when interest is virtually zero to borrow money to start a bakery, for God's sakes. There's no mortgage system. So when President Bush and I were asked by President Obama to raise some money, we decided, look, everybody else has given all this, you know, for the emergencies. We're going to spend our money to spark long-term sustainability. And we set up a mortgage system and a small business loan program. And now we've got banks saying, hey, we might change that. Maybe we'll do that. We, we, we can have a mortgage system. We can do this. That's the kind of thing that you have to do everywhere. You have to set up a – you have to convince – the rich people in poor countries, they can do better by taking a smaller percentage of a very, very big pie. And that's really important. It, it's a huge issue everywhere. And people can't imagine that. Let me ask you something, Kennedy. What, what about all these students here who don't come from someplace like Cuba, even in the United States, who want to work there, and they have limited money, how can they have an impact? What would, what's your advice to them? How can they, they can't be you, they didn't come from a place like that, but they want to do something meaningful. What's the best way to do it? Uh, I want to be honest with you, and I believe that, they, I believe in what's called global, partnership. The world is becoming small through the social media all those kind of things. Okay? But one thing we have to keep in our mind. You are going to work in a community that you don't know well. Let's not judge them. We don't understand how much to stay two days without food means. We don't understand why we can call it gender equality but yet there's less resources. And the only people who can survive there are men. Why? We have to ask ourselves this kind of question. But anybody in the world want to be appreciated and be made feel better. So when you come to my community, you make me feel valuable. You want to listen to me. And you are a brother and sister who are just trying to work with me together. You see, I tell you it is possible. One example has been Jessica Posner. She's now in Kenya, working in Kibera. I'm in the US studying. 
you know. But because of that partnership, because of that respect and mutual understanding, you can go far. And I know now you have commitments and you are going to those communities. I want to tell you, then they need you. Because they can do it alone, you can do it alone. You need to work together. Honestly, Kennedy or dead five years ago, charisma in the slum. I was not going anywhere, but I was trying. But when, when young people, you know, there's a, there's, it is a time of revolution, I tell you. It's not only in North Africa, it is on our brain. And that's why young people are having innovative ideas that are changing lives, you know. So when you think about revolution, don't just think about North Africa. It is here, 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 here. Those ideas that you have that can change the world. And we need to work together. You know, maybe we could flesh that out just a little bit. One of the most impressive things to me, uh, besides just seeing the quality of the young people who were interviewed in the 24-hour day coverage we got out of Cairo and the somewhat more limited coverage we got out of Tunis, is to learn that they had been communicating for two years with each other over the Internet and had also made um, contact with young people in Belgrade who had worked in Serbia to bring down Mr. Milosevic. And what I kept thinking was, um, and there's a school for kind of organizers that they went to in Qatar, but that's the only kind of non-virtual reality, you know, the only kind of thing they did that wasn't in cyberspace together. So I was trying to ask myself, uh, if you're trying to build something, which is what you're doing, instead of just take down a government, is there some way that we can get much higher levels of participation in doing this kind of work and have people learn how to do it uh, over the internet? I think that's really, you know, important. And, you know, you've been a little modest here, but this is kind of a, a breakthrough, I think, in Kibera, the, what you're doing for young girls and women. But it's a breakthrough that has to be done everywhere. If you're worried about the population in the world growing fastest in the poorest places, least able to take care of them, and you know that given religious and tribal and cultural restrictions, some places you can do family planning, other places you can't. Some places people will use birth control, other places they won't. The one thing that has worked all over the world in every culture to reduce population growth is to put all the girls in school and give all the young women access to the labor market. It always does it. So to talk about that. What, what would you say to them? I, I'd like to ask both of you this question. If a, if 100 people after this is over come up to each of you and says, I'll give you three months of my life, what would you do with them? Would you tell them to stay at home and work? What would you do? You can do anything. You can tell them to say, let's see, I want you to tell me how to spend the next three months and I'll do whatever you say. What would you do if a hundred of these young people came up and asked you that? What would you do? You know what you'd tell them? Yeah, I think, well, for the first thing I'd say, there, there, was, there was a thing that I was thinking about. I'd spoken about it in one of the other uh, venue where... Norman Mailer had said at one time that this may be the first century that mankind doesn't survive. And I, and I, and I think this, it, it, it's a significant century, not for that reason, but because it's the first century that uh, where what, what is happening in North Africa has really shown that this is the greatest time to be young and involved because for the first time it's being proven that principle is strategy. And so... What, what, what happens now in this hundred years, I think it'll be the first hundred years where we will all live to see our own accountability uh, for what we did or did not participate in. G given that, I, if I had any uh, one of you for three months, I would, I would say um, uh, f fundraise for my organization every day. And now that you're fundraising and you have my phone number, badger me with a better idea for how you'll be valuable to the thing, and uh, we'll, we'd, we would find a place for you. But, but there, there is a place that when I've, the people that have come 
and volunteer to have many of whom, in the same way that we work to uh, give the, the empowerment back to the Haitians, to, to work ourselves out of a job, but we do that with our own staff members. And many have gone on to, 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 to once learning the ground to understand a way that they can invest their particular passion, that one that's gonna, gonna continue and that they'll stay committed to because it's not all going to be cookie cutter and and the models for example in Haiti the models don't have to be repetitive models it has to be a model of com of, of commitment and of passion and belief and and a follow through that completes a project that is 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 improving the lives of those who it reaches to and and that on its own need not i remember you know i thought of this with when marlon brando was the the model and it destroyed an entire generation of actors who tried to be Marlon Brando. <clears throat> so in Haiti, when we think about modeling projects, uh, I, I don't think that, the, that, you know, there's anyone in this room might have a great model that in its boldness alone will infect a, a culture of, of social revolution. And, and I think in, in, it, that Haiti is that, that right place where it's going to be particularly tangible. So, a hundred of these people said, I'll give you three months, I'll do whatever you want. If you want me to go around and collect a dollar a day for you at home, I'll do it. Just tell me what you want, anything you want. If you had a hundred of them and you wanted to maximize their impact for good, what would you do? What would you tell them to do? What I tell them is to follow their passion. Because I believe that when you work on something that you feel passionate about, you can make a big movement. And if their passion is what I'm doing, I let them join my army of social good. It's a <laughs> At lunch today, I had a meeting with uh, a large number of the students who came here from other countries. And I just let them ask questions. And one of the students said, suppose you got one of those magic lamps and a genie came out and offered you three wishes for the whole world, what would your wishes be? And I basically said in a more long-winded way that I would like to, I would wish for everyone to have an opportunity to have the education, health, and employment that would reduce inequality in the world. I, didn't, I don't think you can have a good society with the level of inequality we have. I would like it uh, if we had a, a kind of economy that would require radically changing the way we produce and consume energy so we would not only avoid the worst consequences of climate change, but we'd have long-term sustainable economic growth. And I wish people would, con my third wish was that we should concentrate more on the 99.5% of our genetic makeup that's the same as everybody else and less on the half a percent that's different. And so, but it's the same thing. And I, I know we're out of time, but for some reason, and I don't want to embarrass either one of you, but I'm known nowhere near the poverty you were grown up in, you've grown up in. But it's a relative thing in terms of what it does to your mind. When I was a boy growing up in Arkansas at the end of World War II, our income was just a little over one half the national average. So people tended to look down on us and thought we were stupid. Well, I knew better than that. I knew that the truth is we had no education. We had no opportunities. And that was back before there was the impact of the GI Bill in America. And you could go to a gas station to get gas, and the local mechanic might have a higher IQ than the physician. Life chances were a crapshoot. You want to even them out. And... I think one of the biggest problems we have in the world today is that too many of us have accepted the way things are, that the, the way we use and consume energy is inevitable. It's just too easy. The way, uh, so it's too bad there's a lot of poor people, I'll give a higher percentage of my money away instead of how can I invest it to empower them. And one of the places we work in uh, Africa with the AIDS work and agriculture work in the rural areas when people see each other and one says hello the answer is not hello how are you the answer is I see you 
in English, I see you. You think about all the people in the world today who are never seen. Why are you so moved by him? Well, he's impressive. He got out of this horrible slum. He's at Wesleyan. He gives a good speech. He's charismatic. But, oh, my God, he still cares about all those people he left behind. And he knows that a bunch of them could do what he's done if they just had the same set of chances. He sees them. I think one of the reasons Sean stayed in Haiti is he saw them. They're amazing. They've been treated like a basket case and and abused and neglected or patronized for over 200 years. Second time I went down there after the earthquake. Any of you have ever been to Port-au-Prince know you, you land at the airport and you drive down this street which is wrecked and now covered with tents. And um, there are, on the good days, there were, you come to a place where there are these little wrought iron fences and they're all covered with Haitian art on both sides of the street. And then on one side of the street, there's a little park. And the time I was there, the last time before the earthquake, there were a hundred, give or take, artists in the park. You know, it's like the national pastime, the, the woodwork, the painting, the metalwork. So the second time I went down there, everything was still terrible. But there were about eight brave souls who had gamely put their art up, even though hardly any planes were landing except to bring humanitarians in. So I stopped my motorcade. I said, I want everybody to get out, everybody buy a picture, and nobody bargain with them about the prices today. Pay whatever they ask. So I went and bought three little pictures, and I was leaving. And this guy screamed at me, you can't leave without buying something from me. You bought something from me in 2002, which is true. I was down there when Aristide was in his second term, and we were starting our AIDS work in Haiti. So I, I went over, and he showed me a little picture he had. And we started talking, and I said to this guy, who had a smile on his face, you know, I said, uh, God, I admire you for being here. And he said, oh, you shouldn't admire me. He said, I lost my wife and children in the earthquake. I have nothing else to do. And he said, but we're all a family here. Everyone knows everyone else's story. And the only way I can honor my wife and children is to show up here because they know if I can do it, then they have to have the courage to come back too. All over the world, there are people like that. The reason you like them is they see those people. And if you do, and enough people do, and you just do what you can, it doesn't matter if you're a famous movie star, and it doesn't matter if you happen to live in where you're trying to help, you can make a difference. We didn't know a single solitary one of those kids that changed the course of Egypt or Tunisia, except for we have one Tunisian student here, I know, native. So I ask you, just think about that. Don't patronize people, see them. And think of yourself as working yourselves out of a job. All most people want is to be able to stand on their own two feet and make their own decisions about their lives and their dreams. And I'm very grateful that there are people like Kennedy and Sean who are helping. Thank you very much. Once more, we'll give him the last word. We'll give him the last word. I know, I know what you're passing through, and I feel, because I remember many years back in my community, I saw no way, and I saw that there's no other way. And the reason you're doing what you do is because you believe in, and you can't wait when things are going unjustice, you know? And I want to tell you that, just hold on there. Look for people like you who are also trying to do something good. I want to tell you, it's not easy, but don't give up. Thank you. Good for you. Thank you. Let's give him another hand. Come on.